So the sermon, um, The Wisdom of Paul Gray, is not really a sermon. Um, it's great, Dale just did the reading. So think back to when you were in elementary school. What was about the best thing that could happen to you? You walk in and the teacher's not in and you have a substitute. So then either one, you don't have to take the quiz you were going to take, or you don't have to take the test that you were going to take, or the book report that you didn't get done isn't due today, or you're going to have a movie. That was like the ultimate. You're going to have a movie. Well, the teacher is not here today, and the substitute is doing a movie. <laughs> so this, um, I don't know, I, I think some of you are aware that I do a uh, prison ministry mostly. It's called Kairos. It's in uh, many countries. It's in about 35 states in the United States. Um, in some of the states, it's in multiple prisons. Um, this is about a man who, uh, I'll let him tell the story, but he spent most of his life in prison and went to a Kairos weekend and how it changed his life. Last year when I was here, I talked about God wanting to forgive you. The next week I preached about, okay, so God wants to forgive you, now you need to forgive others. The third week I talked about, okay, great, you're going to forgive others, but you have to forgive everybody and judging people, trying not to judge the two sides of the coin. So trying not to judge people. So now, and then Pastor Miriam last week was talking about forgiveness and trying to accept other people. Again, it's not easy teaching. I'm not up here. I'm not the poster boy for forgiveness. I don't have a lock on it. I make plenty of mistakes myself. Um, but this gentleman is going to talk a little bit about how people can change. Uh, doing the prison ministry early on, my sisters and brothers and some other people would say to me, why are you wasting your time with them, you know? You could be doing something else for people who deserve it. People can change, people can turn into something different. And this is going to give you an idea of that. This is also closed caption, so if you can't hear it and you want to move forward more, to read your closed caption? Yeah, that uh, originally from Texas. Um, I grew up there. My father um, was killed when I was a little boy, and I was without supervision. Uh, my mother was lacking in any, any formal education, and she supported us uh, with, by doing washing and ironing. This occupied her time so much that she had very little time to discipline us. She was a very, very good lady, very good Christian. But the only, she only had time to provide us with the necessities of life. And of course, I was too young to realize the profundity of what she would tell me. I grew up as I pleased. I took to the streets. There were many times before I had reached the double digits that I stayed out all night. When I was hungry, I would just break into a grocery store and eat my fill and, and leave. I was little more than a wild animal. I learned early on in life that violence could get me what I wanted. I carried weapons, or a weapon, a knife. I found that what I liked in rhetoric I could make up for in threats, and I found that people would usually comply uh, to a threat of violence. I resigned myself to believe that this is the way that I should live, that I could get what I want by illegal means and by violence. Well, this continued for the better part of my life. I was arrested the first time when I was 10 years old. Jail wasn't that bad. Uh, the jail I was in, a friend of mine and myself, he was a couple of years older than I, we had stole, some of you might remember, there used to be a, a motor scooter called a Cushman, Cushman motor scooter. And we had a fancy for that, and we wanted it, and we took it. 
we got arrested in a small town and put put me in jail and the sheriff brought a, a watermelon in there and gave us each a half a watermelon and even put his uh, little dog in the cell with us. I thought, well, this is nothing. I was <laughs> eating watermelon and petting the dog. <laughs> but uh, this trend of malbehavior continued. I, I was in prison and in reform school, in and out so much that I never really became socialized. I was uh, in prison so much that I knew the way the ways of prison better than I knew the ways outside. Uh, the outside world simply became a place where I would rejuvenate myself, make some money, and have some fun before I would go back. This continued for a long time uh, until I amassed in the neighborhood of 15 years incarcerated in three different states, Texas, New Jersey, and New York. The last time I went to prison was in 1982. I was ashamed of myself. I was really, really ashamed of myself. I was disgusted. I was my worst enemy. Well, I went to Attica first. I was in Attica, and they sent me to from Attica out of reception to a place called Albion. I was so disgusted and filled with self-hatred that I wanted to end my life. But I decided to do it, to go out in a, in a flash. There were a couple of guys in the facility that I didn't like. I considered them to be big mouths extortionist. They were taking advantage of other guys. <clears throat> I've always liked to grab the toughest of the tough to show them that I'm the main rooster. I am the rooster. I wanted to take these two guys off the count. Now, in our terminology in prison, off the count means I want to kill them. <clears throat> this obsession became a psychosis in that I actually sat down and planned this out. I was looking for an opportune time. I knew that in killing these two guys that I and myself would lose my life, but I would have rid the earth of three scum guys, three really worthless guys. Well, I was in the yard one day. His Probably a day or two after I had thought this out, I thought the mess hall would probably be the best place to do it because when a fight breaks out in the mess hall, guys just scatter everywhere. And if you have any problems with any other guys, they're usually settled in the confusion. There's usually many, many disputes are resolved in the confusion. I was walking in the yard and the chaplain came over to me, he called, called me over. He said, Paul, come here. I walked over, he said, I would like you to make a Kairos weekend. I said, what are you talking about? <laughs> he said, well, there's a program coming in. I'd like you to get involved in it. I said, what is it? He said, I can't tell you. And said, it's, he said, I can't describe it. Just tell me you'll go. He said, there's good food. So, I said, all right, I will. That's all he told me. Now, that night in the mess hall, I talked to a couple of my buddies, and they told me that he had also approached them. The more guys I talked to, the more I realized he had picked out all the bad guys in the place. <laughs> I thought, what's going on? He's picked out all the hardheads in the whole place. What is this Kairos thing? Are they going to give us shock treatments or something? <laughs> well, the day of Kairos came, and the fellows came in, came in from the outside, and I'm telling you, they were frightened. They went in the chapel, and they were sitting around, and folks like yourself, 
And we walked in, and it looked like the Purple Gang coming in there. <laughs> we, I'm telling you, we didn't know what to expect. We walked in there. Immediately, I realized what was going on. Aha, Christians. <laughs> I was ready. <laughs> well, there are a couple of men here that made that first Kairos. Dick Usher was one, and he can tell you that as I was not the most congenial person in the world those first couple of days, I, I tried my best to get everybody mad. <clears throat> I said, I know what you people want. You're burdened with guilt because you've had everything handed to you. Your concept of adversity is your stake is overdone. <laughs> well, I was going to prevent them from coming in and un unloading any guilt on me, telling me what a good person they were and what a bad person I am. And I just kept barking and barking, and it occurred to me that I wasn't hearing any barking back. <laughs> Nobody was saying anything back. I was angry, and the more I talked, they smiled. They said, I understand. I said, yeah, you don't understand. What do you mean you understand? What are you talking about you understand? They smiled, and they loved me, and they forgave me. The first night that we had the carols, I went back. One of the fellows asked me, what's that thing all about over there? I heard some singing and stuff. I said, I don't know yet. A bunch of people come in. They're not what I thought. They're Christians, but they're, they're different. They're different kind of Christian. They gave us cookies and everything. I shared, <laughs> shared my cookies with the guys. They really liked the cookies. <laughs> but the next day, I went back, and I started pretty much the same thing all over again. Dylan, I, I cornered Dylan. I was barking at him, and he was smiling at me. <laughs> But as the weekend progressed, I began to realize that these people were serious, that they didn't want anything from me. They didn't want to judge me. They hadn't come in to, to belittle me or to make me feel bad. They had come in to tell me that you've made mistakes, but it's not too late. You can change. God loves you. We love you. You can change your life. We'll help you. We'll be here and help you. But I think it was the third day that Polanka came in. I started reading the plank and I started crying. I'm telling you, it was like Niagara Falls. I couldn't stop it. It was long overdue. I was sobbing like a baby. And I was mad. Now I'm really mad. I said, Jesus. <laughs> now I'm going to go back out into the compound. I'm not going to be able to take what I want. These guys are going to snicker at me and this and that. My reputation is shot. <laughs> but I felt good. <laughs> I really felt good. I can honestly say... For the first time in my life, I felt like this enormous weight had been taken off of me. Have you ever been in a situation where afterwards you sit down and your brain is warm and it's numb? It's, it's almost like, I don't know how to explain it. I went back that night to my barracks and I sat down and I was just mesmerized. I was thinking, but it wasn't thinking. I was just, something was going on. A transition was happening. I started reading the Bible. I opened the Bible, and I was ready to punch the first guy that came over and said something to me. <laughs> but I started reading the Bible, and I started reading Proverbs. and said, my son, 
you'll follow my ways and do what I tell you, you will be happy, this and that. And it was like getting a letter from your father. The more I read it, the more I thought, well, I wonder why I never, I never took time to read this. There's so much wisdom here, so much understanding. He knows exactly how I feel. I realized then that there was hope that I could change. I was beginning to feel good about myself. I began to look at guys that I really didn't like, didn't like at all. It just angered me to get around them. I began to see them in a different way as frail, frightened human beings. People that needed to talk, that needed to be touched. Well, needless to say, I abandoned my deranged project that I'd been putting together just before Kairos. Inside me was beginning to grow a deep hunger, a need to do something to help others. And I began to think. I went off and became a recluse of sorts. I would sit by myself and I would think when I get out, I'm going to help people. I'm going to keep people from coming to prison. I'm going to tell them about Christ. And it occurred to me, this is the nature of my talk, discovering Christ in prison. It occurred to me that I was in a tomato field looking for something to eat. I was in a place where guys were lost and forlorn and lonely. They needed Christ. I set out in my own novice way to try to befriend guys, to talk to them. It was very uncomfortable at first to go from being a guy that's feared to being a guy that is almost, you know, slap him, he won't do nothing, watch, really slap him, that sort of a thing. <laughs> it was difficult. But I discovered that when you have Christ in your life, don't plan to do something next week. Next week I'm going to go and help this person or help that person. I learned that you, you help people where you, you find them. Christ will put you in situations. Don't question. Don't second guess God. You will find yourself in a situation the human side of you will say, no, I, I'll be embarrassed if I do that. I can't do that. Don't do that. God has put you there for that reason. He's put you in that situation. We always think of what we're going to do tomorrow, what we should have done yesterday. Well, let me tell you that the past, excuse me, the past resigns itself to memory. It's gone. It's gone forever. And so are opportunities that were there. The future is nothing but an abstraction. It's based in hope. All we have is the moment. You cannot let the moment pass when you see an opportunity to share Christ, to do a kind thing. Do it. Do it then. Don't wait for your back in your neighborhood with your friend. Do it then. That stranger that you're embarrassed to meet is a friend. He's two seconds from being a friend. She's 30 seconds from being a sister. Oh, so I know that was a long way. Since it was a little long, I'm not going to talk too much. But I will next week. <laughs> and some of what I talk about next week will have to do with this and other things. Um, I will say 
that you heard him say about how much time he spent in prison. He never went back to prison again. Um, he did a lot inside the prison, and then when he got out, he got a degree and he became a counselor. And he started uh, going into the troubled areas, and I believe it was California. I'm not positive where I think it was LA, but I've forgotten. My memory's getting worse. And he tried to keep guys from going into prison. So people can change and they can become a new creation, as it says in scripture, a new creation of Christ. So when we try to put people in boxes and say, you know, this person's that or that person's that, they may be right then, but you don't know how they're going to change and how God's going to use them later on. I want to close this with a scripture reading. Uh, this is a continuation of where we were with Matthew. This is Matthew 5, 43 through 48. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. He causes the sun to rise on both the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your brothers, what are you doing more than others? Do not even the pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. 